Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws mm. and Gunslingers with your host, Bang and Dang, and back once again to finish off the... Well, mainly to finish off the Fort Wagner story, but... We got a uh, another conflict with the African Americans and uh, the Native Americans. Is what I meant to say, <laughs> and uh, the Union, I believe, had the Honey Springs battle, also known as the Fair of Elk Creek. Then we got the Second Charleston Harbor and the Second Fort Wagner, which uh, we all know the story behind that one. We're gonna wait. It's only July seventeenth. What? Not even two weeks away from Gettysburg. It's crazy. So everybody's forgot about it already. It's been 70 battles since then. I'm sure they Good forgot stuff. about the day after. Right. Well, not the people in Gettysburg. Um, yeah, Honey Springs, checking, second Charleston Harbor, second Fort Wagner, starting out with Honey Springs, July 17th, in the Union's efforts to gain control of the Indian Territory. That's what we're uh, trying to see right here. It was the largest confrontation between Union and Confederate forces in the area that would eventually become Oklahoma. The engagement was also unique in the fact that white soldiers were the minority in both fighting forces. Native Americans made up a significant portion of each of the opposing armies, and the Union force contained African American units as well. So look at that. Very little white people, huh? At the very start of the American Civil War, for cultural and economic reasons, all the five civilized tribes in the Indian Territory opted to side with the Confederates, raising Native troops under the leadership of General Douglas H. Cooper. They drove out pro-Union Creek Indian forces after a short campaign culminating in the Battle of Chustanahalaha. Chustanala, we had that a while ago. How Alpha, by 1863, Confederate fortunes in the region had sunk. Union campaign launched from Kansas, led by Major General James Blunt. Yo, beautiful. Drove Confederate forces from the north of the region. And many of the Cherokee switched sides to support the Union. Wow, of course it did. Union forces led by Colonel William A. Phillips reoccupied Fort Gibson in Indian Territory during April, threatening Confederate forces at Fort Smith. However, Phillips' supply line stretched from Fort Gibson to Fort Scott, Kansas, 175 miles to the north along to the, uh, along the old Texas Road cattle trail. Confederate cavalry operating from Cooper's encampment and Honey Springs frequently harassed Fort Gibson and attacked its supply trains. Hmm. Right. I mean, you got to do something. Battle of Honey Springs was very important for many reasons. Among them, the battle was the largest fought in the Indian Territory based on numbers of troops engaged. Okay. White soldiers were the minority in both Union and Confederate, which we said. Native Americans made up a significant portion of each. The loss of supplies at Honey Springs Depot would likewise prove disastrous. Confederate forces already operating on a shoestring budget and with bad equipment would come to increasingly rely on captured Union war material to keep on the fight. Honey Springs was an important site along with the Texas Road, a north-south artery between uh, North Texas and Baxter Springs, Kansas, or Joplin, Missouri. The side that controlled this place could control traffic along this very road. Honey Springs was a direct threat to Fort Gibson, which controlled shipping on the upper Arkansas River. Okay, so we got a lot at stake here, it seems like, huh? Took them long enough to get there. Right. Honey Springs was a stage stop on the Texas Road before the Civil War. Its several springs provided water for men and horses. The U.S. Army equipped it with a commissary, log hospital, and numerous tents for troops. To prepare for an invasion in 1863, in 1863, the Confederate Army sent 6,000 soldiers to the spot. Provisions were supplied from Fort Smith, Boggy Depot, Fort Cobb, Fort Arbuckle, and Fort Washita. However, the Confederates failed to stop a 200-wagon Federal supply train in an engagement known as the Battle of Cabin Creek, which we covered. Yep. The supply train reached Fort Gibson about the same time as General Blunt himself arrived, accompanied by more troops and artillery. Well, that's got to make a general happy. Right. Federal right. forces at the fort totaled about 3,000 men. According to his after-action after report to General Schofield, Blunt arrived in the area on 11th of July, 1863. He found that Arkansas River was high and ordered his troops to begin building boats to ferry them across. During this very time, he apparently contracted encephalitis because he had spent July 14th in bed fighting a fever. Oh. Believing they were numerically superior, the Confederates plotted a counteroffensive against the Union forces at Fort Gibson to be launched by Cooper's Indians and some attached uh, Texan troops as well. 
and about 3,000 soldiers of the Brigadier General William Cabal's uh, brigade. They were camped in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which were expected to reach Honey Spring by the 17th of July. And they probably did, since that's when the battle started. Well, Cooper moved his army forward to Honey Springs, uh, an important Confederate supply depot to rest and equip, while awaiting Cabell's, or Cabell's, Cabell's brigade marching to link up with Cooper. Union forces under General Blunt got wind of Cooper's plan and opted to attack him first before Cabell, Cable, I'll call him Cable, Cabell, Cabell, Cabell before Cabell arrived, which would have given the Confederates overwhelming numerical superiority. Right. Blunt's command included three Federal Indian Home Guard regiments recruited from all the five nations and the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry with two white cavalry battalions, the 6th Kansas and 3rd Wisconsin, one white infantry battalion consistent of six companies of the 2nd Colorado Infantry Regiment, and two Kansas artillery batteries making the remainder. Look at that shit. All right. Blunt's troops crossed the Arkansas River in the late afternoon of the 16th of July. They began marching toward Honey Springs at about 11 p.m., continued throughout midnight. They encountered, a counter, <laughs> they encountered a Confederate picket near Chimney Rock, a local landmark. After routing that picket, they met a Confederate scouting party north of Elk Creek. They came upon the Confederate camp on Elk Creek early in the morning on the 17th of July. The Confederate pickets saw the enemy guns in the early light and rushed to inform Cooper. After eating breakfast and resting from the march, Blunt formed his men into two brigades. One of those brigades, led by William A. Phillips and composed of a battalion of the 6th Kansas Cavalry, the 1st and 3rd Regiments of Indian Home Guards, a battalion of the 2nd Colorado Infantry, and Captain Henry Hopkins' four-gun battery of that Kansas artillery, plus two guns of Captain Edward Smith's battery attached to the cavalry. The other one, commanded by Colonel William Judson, consisted of the 3rd Wisconsin Cavalry, the 2nd Regiment of the Indian Home Guards, and the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, with an estimated 700 soldiers, plus they had the remainder of Smith's battery of his Kansas artillery. Right. Blunt's attack began on the 17th of July in the morning, and skirmishing that revealed many of the Confederate soldiers had wet gunpowder, causing numerous misfires and accidents. The main Union attack began at mid-afternoon, and the beginning of a rain squall intensified the Confederates' ammunition problems. Yeah, you gotta keep that ammo dry, man. Opposing the powder. Ar- right. Opposing artillerymen each eliminated one gun on the opposing side during an early artillery duel. Oh, look, at that. look at that. Then Blunt saw an opportunity. He ordered the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry to attack. Colonel James Williams led the Colored and Volunteer Infantry forward, but the Confederates held their very ground. They're like, we're not going to let those Negroes run us away. <laughs> uh, Williams was wounded, but his troops conducted a disciplined withdrawal and sporadic firing continued. Well, afterwards, Blunt wrote, Yo, beautiful! <laughs> he said, I never saw such fighting was done by the Negro Regiment. Uh, the question that Negroes will fight is settled. We've already settled this. Mm-hmm. Besides, they make better soldiers in every respect than any troops I have ever had under my command, he right. said. Um, during this period, the 2nd Indian Home Guards fighting for the Union accidentally strayed into no man's land between the Confederate and Union lines. The Federal commander, he don't say nothing about the Indians. Right. Right? The Federal commanders gave the order for the Home Guards to fall back, and the Confederates assumed it was an order to retreat and attack. The Confederates charged into an established defensive line held by the 1st Kansas Colored Volunteer Infantry, which repulsed the charge. Look at that. Stupids. All right. Cooper then pulled his men backwards towards the depot to obtain new ammunition. But Federals continued to press his arm closely. Heavy fighting occurred when Cooper's men made a stand at a bridge over Elk Creek, roughly a quarter mile south of the original position. Union forces continued driving them back, further and further, and gradually beginning to turn Cooper's left, causing a general Confederate retreat. Cooper attempted to fight a rear guard action, making a last stand another half mile south near Honey Springs Depot. Despite a notable half-hour stand by the Choctaw and the Chickasaw Regiment, the Indians and the Texans were badly organized, disheartened, and in many cases, due to poor powder, unarmed. Wow. Most simply continued to flee. The fighting was over by 2 p.m., four hours after it had begun. Jeez. Mm, That's sad. Victorious Union forces took possession of the Honey Springs Depot, burning what couldn't be immediately used and occupying the field. Blunt trumpeted the battle as a major victory, claiming Union union losses of only 76, which were 17 dead, 60 wounded, with enemy casualties in excess of 500, although Cooper reported only 181 Confederate casualties, which was 134 killed or wounded and 47 taken prisoner. Cooper claimed that his enemy forces' losses were over 200. That's possible. Of course. Right. They're all going to say shit. Who knows? Yeah, nobody. The Union Army, including its black and Native American forces, 
had a definite edge in both quantity and quality of weaponry. The Union artillery had 10 1857 12-pounder Napoleon howitzers, two six-pound howitzers, and plenty of Springfield rifles. The Union troops also had an abundance of shot, shells, and canisters. Confederates, well, poorly armed, typically with obsolete smoothbore muskets, flintlock shotguns. Oh, jeez. Ammunition for these was primarily made with cheap Mexican gunpowder that was very successful to damage by rainy weather. Which we've already seen. Right. The terrible equipment of the Confederates and the rain squall, which ruined their powder, played a large part in the defeat. Although some eyewitness sources, notably future Creek Indian chief George Washington Grayson, okay, claim that Cooper's poor generalship was responsible for the defeat, arguing that about half the Confederate army was never even engaged. Oh, wow. So he's like, he didn't even send what he could. What an idiot. After the battle, defeated Confederates withdrew, leaving their dead comrades behind. They met up with Cabal's 3,000 men relief force about 50 miles away. But General Blunt did not pursue them, as usual, because his own troops and horses were very tired. Were very, very tired. Very, very. He ordered them to camp overnight at the battlefield, where they could treat the wounded and bury the dead of both sides. Uh Uh-huh. Good for you guys. Blunt himself was still suffering a high fever from his bout of encephalitis. He finally had to spend the rest of the day in bed. Late that next day, Blunt ordered the troops to return to Fort Gibson. Later, Cooper wrote a letter to Blunt, thanking him for burying the Confederate dead. After the war, the Union corpse were exhumed and reburied in Fort Gibson National Cemetery. He's like, hey, thanks for uh, doing something, because I was too much of a pussy to stick around. The battle was the largest ever fought in Indian territory, which you said, and would indeed prove to be decisive. Oklahoma Historical Society even compared its importance to the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm. I don't know that. Maybe right. in the state of Oklahoma. All right. The victory opened the way for Blunt's forces to capture Fort Smith and the Arkansas River Valley all the way to the Mississippi. Jeez. The Confederates abandoned Fort Smith in August of 1863, leaving it for Union forces to recover. Of course they did. Well, there's a battle there that they didn't just run away from it. All right. Uh, despite the efforts of notable Confederate officers like Stan Wadey, I've heard that name like before. Confederate forces in the region would never, ever again regain the initiative or engage the Union Army in an open head-on battle again. Wow. Instead, relying almost entirely on guerrilla warfare and small-scale cavalry actions to fight the Federal Army. Okay. The loss of the supplies at Honey Springs Depot would likewise prove disastrous, like it said it would. Confederate forces already operating on a shoestring budget and with bad equipment would come to increasingly rely on... Ca- we already didn't know. All right. <laughs> Yeah, they're not getting anywhere without stealing from the unions like a bunch of vultures. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, just give up. The You're already cut off from your other army across the Mississippi anyways, dude. Just stop. All right. Man, that was terrible. Oh, I forgot I had to switch this around. Fort Wagner comes before Charleston. All right, moving on. Second battle, Fort Wagner. Also known as the Second Salt on Morris Island, or the Battle of Fort Wagner, <laughs> or Morris Island. No, it's the Battle of Fort Wagner, Morris Island. Oh. Uh, this was fought on the 18th of July, 1863, in Fort Wagner, or Battery Wagner, as it was known to the Confederates. It controlled the southern approach to the Charleston Harbor. It sure did. It was commanded by Brigadier General William Telefero. Attempt was made on July 11th to assault the fort, the first battle of Fort Wagner. Last episode we did. Yep, but it was repulsed with heavy losses to the attackers because of artillery and musket fire from the, the Confederates. Brigadier General Quincy Gilmore from the north intended to repeat his assault, but first executed feints to distract the Confederates' attention. The Battle of Grimball's Landing on the 16th of July was one of them. Which we did that last episode. Gilmore also ordered an artillery bombardment of the fort. The fort was on a very narrow island, so the Union could only assault the fort with one regiment at a very time. Mm. Mm. The approach to the fort was constricted to a strip of beach 60 yards wide with the ocean to the east and the marsh from the Vincent's uh, Creek to the west. Upon rounding this defile, uh, the Union Army was presented with the 250 yards south face of Fort Wagner, which stretched from Vincent's Creek to the sea. Oh, jeez. Surrounding the fort was a shallow moat riveted with sharpened palmetto logs Ooh. and abatis, or abatis, and the most... And the most, and the moat on the seaward side had planks with spikes positioned beneath the water. They did. You ain't, you ain't, dry, you ain't diving in them. Uh, uh, the armament of the Fort Wagner on the night of July 18th consisted of one 10-inch seacoast mortar, two 32-pound carronades, uh, two 8-inch shell guns, two 32-pound howitzers, a 42-pound carronade, and an 8-inch seacoast mortar on the land face. Right. Dude, they're like, you ain't getting Fort Wagner, dudes. Mm, company Do they ever? I don't I, think so. I don't know. Company A of the 1st South Carolina Artillery had two guns positioned outside Wagner's southern face by Vincent's Creek, 
to provide uh, fire for anywhere coming around. The sea face of Wagner was armed with one 32-pound carronade, one 10-inch columbide, columbiad, and two 12-ounce howitzers. Or 12-pound. <laughs> right, 12-pound. <laughs> <laughs> The garrison of Battery Wagner consisted of the 1st South Carolina Artillery, the Charleston Battalion, and the 31st North Carolina, and also the 51st North Carolina. All right. Well, Gilmore ordered his siege guns and mortars to begin a bombardment of the fort on July 18th. They were joined by the naval gunfire from six monitors that pulled to within 300 yards of the fort. They got all these guys. They still couldn't even do it, huh? Right. The bombardment lasted eight hours but caused little damage against the sandy walls of the fort. Yeah, it's rough. And in all, killed only about eight men and wounded an additional 20 as the defenders had taken cover in the bomb-proof shelter. Mm. 54th Massachusetts, an infantry regiment composed of African-American soldiers led by the whitey Robert Goldshaw, led the Union attack at dusk. Uh Uh-oh. They were backed by two brigades composed of nine regiments. First Brigade was commanded by General George Strockett Strong and was composed of the 54th Massachusetts, 6th Connecticut, 48th New York, 3rd New Hampshire, 76th Pennsylvania, and the 9th Maine. Uh, the 2nd Brigade was commanded by Colonel Haldeman S. Putman, Putnam of the 7th New Hampshire as acting brigade commander. His brigade consisted of the 7th New Hampshire, 62nd Ohio, 67th Ohio, the 100th New York regiments. 3rd Brigade under General uh, Stevenson was in Resoif. With General Truman Seymour, 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 commanding the field, but did not enter action because mm. he's seen what happened to the 54th. All right. The assault began at 7:45 p.m. and was conducted in three movements. The 54th Massachusetts attacked to the west upon the curtain of Wagner, with the remainder of General Strong's brigade and Colonel Putnam's brigade attacking the seaward salient on the south face. As the assault commenced and the bombardment subsided, the men of the 1st South Carolina Artillery of the Confederates, the Charleston Battalion, and the 51st North Carolina Infantry took their positions. Mm. The 31st North Carolina, which had been completely captured during the Battle of Roanoke Island sometime back and later exchanged, uh. well, they're back, and they remained in the bombproof shelter and did not take its position in the southeast fashion at this time. <laughs> like, no. They're like, if they see us, they'll kill us. They told right. us not to come back. All right. 54th Massachusetts reached about 150 yards from the fort. The defenders opened up with cannon and small arms, tearing through their ranks. 51st North Carolina delivered a direct fire into them as the Charleston Battalion fired into their left. The 54th Massachusetts managed to reach the parapet, but after a fierce struggle, including hand-to-hand combat, they were forced back. 6th Connecticut continued the assault at the weakest point, the southeast, where the 31st had failed to take its position. General Talaferro quickly rounded up some soldiers to take the position while the 51st North Carolina and the Charleston Battalion fired obliquely into the assailants. Jeez. Behind the 6th Connecticut, the 48th New York also successfully reached the slopes of the Bastion. The remainder of Strong's brigade did not reach that far, though, as the three of the defendant howitzers were now in action and firing canister into their flanks, bringing them to a halt. Colonel Putnam quickly brought up his brigade, but only about 100 or 200 men from the 62nd and 67th Ohio reached the bastion. The Confederates attempted to counterattack twice, but were beaten back after having the officers, the officers leading the charge shot down. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. As the Union assault continued to crumble due to lack of reinforcements from General Stevenson, Talia Farrell was reinforced by the 32nd Georgia Infantry, which had been transported to the island by Brigadier General Johnson Haggood. The fresh troops swept over the bastion, killing and capturing the rest of the Union troops that remained. Oh, no. 10 p.m. Bloody struggle had concluded with heavy losses. General George Crockett Strong was mortally wounded in the thigh by grape shot while trying to rally his men. Colonel Putnam was shot in the head and moited while given the order to withdraw. Mm. Colonel John uh, Lyman Chatfield of the 6th Connecticut was mortally wounded. The 54th Massachusetts Colonel Robert Goldshaw was moitered upon the parapet early in the action. Early. Some Confederate reports claim his body was pierced seven times, with the fatal wound being a rifle bullet to his chest. Sergeant Major Lewis Henry Douglas, son of the famous uh, orator Frederick Douglas, survived the battle and wrote about it in a letter to his future wife. He did. In all, about 1,515 Union soldiers were killed, captured, or wounded in the assault of July 18th, although this number has never been accurately ascertained. General Haggard, the commander of Fort Wagner on the morning of July 19th, stated in his report to PGT Beauregard that he buried 800 bodies and mass graves in front of Wagner. Only 315 men were left from the 54th after the battle. 30 Mm. were killed in action, including Shaw and Captains Russell and Simpkins, and buried together in a single grave. Yep. Mm. 24 later died of wounds, 
15 were captured. 52 were reported missing after the battle and never seen again. The men in the 54th Massachusetts were hailed for their valor. William Carney, an African-American sergeant with the 54th, is considered the first black recipient of the Medal of Honor for his actions that very day. Uh, and because re- he recovered and returned the units of the U.S. flag to Union lines. Good for him. Their conduct improved the reputation of African Americans as soldiers, leading the Greater Union recruitment of African Americans, which strengthened the Northern states' numerical advantage. Hmm. In addition, the South recognized for the first time that the captured African American soldiers were to be treated as enemy combatants and not criminals. Confederate casualties numbered 174. The fort was reinforced by Brigadier General Johnson Haggard's brigade shortly after the assault had ended. The garrison of Fort Wagner was then changed during the night, and General Haggard assumed command. He was relieved by Colonel Lawrence Kite, who commanded the uh, fort until it was abandoned on September 7th, oh, which we'll get here uh, coming down. General Haggard wrote a book titled Memoirs of the War of Succession, in which he states that the constant bombardment from the Union guns in the weeks following the Second Battle had unearthed such large numbers of the Union dead buried after a saw of the 18th mile. After the assault on the 18th of July, and the air was so sickening with the smell of death that one could no longer stand to be in the fort. Jeez. The constant bombardment caused Confederate soldiers who were moited during the siege to be buried in the walls of Wagner, and they were also constantly being unearthed. Gross. Following the Union repulse, engineers besieged the fort. The Confederates abandoned the fort 7th of September, 1863, after resisting 60 days of shelling. It having been deemed untenable because of the damage from constant bombardment, lack of provisions, and the close proximity of the Union siege trenches to Wagner. Yeah. Okay. May Terrible. 2008, the Trust for Public Land and Partners, including the South Carolina Conservation Bank, Conservation Bank, the South Carolina State Ports Authority, and the Civil War Trust, and many private donors purchased the island on behalf of the city of Charleston from Ginn Resorts for three million bucks. Previously, in 2003, a builder announced his plans to build houses on the track, for which he had an option to buy the trust. Local preservationist Blake Hallman and others formed the Morris Island Coalition, generated, I think we already read this in the last one. They, um, basically, they stopped him from doing it, and uh, they're saving the battlefield, so right. good for them. A depiction of the battle is the climax of the 1989 film, Glory. Good for them. Yeah, good for them. Complete and utter failure, but yeah. Second Battle of Charleston Harbor, also known as the Siege of Charleston Harbor, the Siege of Fort Wagner, or the Battle of Morris Island took place on the July 18th, and, it's, and it lasted to September 11th, 1863. Or 7th. Yeah, September 7th. In the days immediately following the Second Battle, Fort Wagner and Union forces besieged the Confederates' works on Morris Island with an array of military novelties. Union gunners made use of the new piece of artillery known as the Requa Gun. 25 rifle barrel mounted on a, a field carriage. Oh, yeah. Wow. That thing was... That would be a... What you call it, gun? Gatling gun. Right. Oh, oh that one's a straight line gun. Yeah, straight, holy shit. <laughs> it looks like a uh, xylophone. Two, 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 two. Yes. 58 caliber. Two feet long and mounted together in a secure frame, which would be elevated for range. Wow, dude. 175 rounds a minute. That was just... Do, 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 do. I could hey. fire up to 1,800 feet, too. That's not bad. Wow. While sappers dug zigzag trenches toward uh, Fort Wagner, a second novelty was used, the calcium floodlight. Bright lights were flashed upon the defenders, blinding them enough to decrease accuracy. Blinding them enough to decrease accurate return fire while the Union gunners fired safely from behind the lights. <laughs> That's smart as shit, dude. That's awesome. The Confederate defenders also had advantages, though. Oh, did they? The ground the Union sappers were digging through was shallow sand with a muddy base. Mm. The trenching efforts also began to accidentally uncover Union dead from the previous assaults in Fort Wagner. Disease and bad water plagued soldiers on both sides. But it did. Gross, dude. It's nasty. The Union Army maintained a constant rotation of soldiers to man the forward trenches of the Grand Guard. During the evening of August 16th, a Confederate artillery shell burst through the bomb-proof serving as the headquarters for Colonel Joshua Howe, who was the commanding officer of the Grand Guard that evening. Shell fragment struck Colonel Howe, wounded him severely in the head. Despite his quick recovery, the incident prompted the Union commander to exclusively use veteran troops in the forward trenches. Don't know why uh, veteran troops would have prevented a shell exploding, but 
Um, Confederates also kept a constant rotation of soldiers through Fort Wagner and Battery Grig. During the night, rowboats would bring fresh troops from the mainland to replace the garrison. Good for them, huh? Right. Even though they had won a substantial victory at Fort Wagner, the Confederates fully expected the campaign to continue. Having a large garrison to draw from, General Beauregard was prepared to continue the campaign. Immediately in command of Confederate forces surrounding Charleston was former career Army officer and South Carolina businessman Roswell Ripley. Ripley's forces were spread throughout the fortifications surrounding Charleston Harbor and included a division of the local South Carolina militia. Well, Gilmore and Admiral John A. Dahlgren of the Union requested reinforcements from General-in-Chief Henry Halleck. He was reluctant, but nevertheless, a division from the Army of the Potomac was transferred to the south under George Gordon. General John Foster, a Union commander of the Department of North Carolina, enthusiastically sent a division of reinforcements telling Gilmore, Charleston is too important to be lost when so nearly won. Right. It's true. It's very true. Despite the marshy conditions on Morris Island, Union forces had constructed powerful batteries to combat Fort Wagner. These batteries are often named in honor of fallen soldiers such as Battery Strong, Reynolds, Kearney, and Weed. Others were named for high-ranking Army officers such as Batteries Rosecrans and Meade. Inside Fort Wagner, only one 10-inch Columbia faced seaward, and the few landward guns were in poor condition. During Colonel Lawrence Kite's tenure in command of the Confederate garrison, he established signal stations on Fort Wagner's west wall to coordinate with Confederate batteries on James Island. All right, well, Kite's replacement, General Johnson Haggood, made better use of sharpshooters and the few landward guns to impede the Union siege works upon the fort. Confederates protected their own guns and bomb proofs, uh, but exposed themselves to Union naval fire and in the end could only slow the Union trenches. August 2nd, under the direction of Colonel Edward W. Serrell, Union engineers began constructing a battery further inland with the intention of bombing the city of Charleston directly. Oh, man. By August 17th, the massive battery was ready for its armament. They said, we're ready to go, boys. Oh, shit. Lieutenant Charles Selmer, with the detachment of the 11th Maine, was called in to man the 200-pound parrot rifle now being referred to as the Swamp Angel. On August 21st, Gilmore sent an ultimatum to Beauregard to abandon Fort, Forts Wagner and Sumter, or Charleston would be fired upon. When Gilmore received no reply by the following day, the first shot was fired from the Swamp Angel into Charleston, using the steeple of St. Michael's Church for a bearing. It was up there then, huh? On August 22nd, Confederate batteries tried to vain, in vain to silence the Swamp Angel. Yeah, silencing the Swamp Angel. Mm. Bogard scorned Gilmore for turning his guns on a civilian city and demanded an opportunity to evacuate citizens. Gilmore complied with a day of ceasefire, but also took the opportunity to express the fact that uh, Charleston was a legitimate military target as a uh, target as an ammunition supply, ammunition supply, which it was. So better get him. You should have got him out of there anyways. Yep. Uh, Bogard. Firing resumed, but on the 36th shot, the Swamp Angel burst and was not replaced during the campaign. Damn. It was the first time a civilian population was deliberately targeted for military purposes during the war. Wow. Well, it doesn't say last time, so... All right. Despite trenching difficulties by mid-August, Gilmore had his siege guns within range of Fort Sumner. August 17th, he opened fire, and during the first day of the bombardment, nearly 1,000 shells were fired. Peace. By August 23rd, the masonry had been torn to rubble, and Beauregard removed as many of the fort's guns as possible. Gilmore wired the War Department that Fort Sumner is a shapeless and harmless mass of ruin. However, the bombardment of Fort Sumner would continue in general until the 31st of December in 1863. Jeez. Yes. Gilmore's attention returned to Fort Wagner. By now, his forces were close enough to the Confederate works for the infantry to take action. August 21st, Colonel George B. Dandy led the 100 New York Infantry into a rush toward Fort Wagner's rifle pits. The New Yorkers quickly established a temporary picket line, but their success was short-lived. General Haggood ordered a counterattack, which drove off Dandy's men. Following Dandy's attack, <laughs> Confederate engineers began working to strengthen the rifle pits, hoping to force the Union Army into mounting another costly assault. All right. Before work can be completed, though, Gilmore ordered Division Commander General Alfred H. Terry to capture the rifle pits. So uh -oh. we got to get these rifle pits out of here. Right, meow. Terry prepared the 24th Massachusetts Infantry from Brigadier General Thomas Stevenson's brigade to lead the attack. In support was the 3rd New, New Hampshire Infantry. Each member of the 24th Massachusetts was equipped with an additional two shovels, to immediately rebuild the rifle pits once taken. <laughs> nice. On the evening of the 25th of August, General Stevenson personally led the attack forward, covered by fire from the Requa guns. The attack overran the 64th North Carolina Infantry, many of whom surrendered. Colonel 
George Harrison, the fort's commander, ordered an artillery counterattack, but the rifle pits were already toying into a new siege line. Ooh. September 5th, Gilmore and Admiral Dahlgren attacked with an intense bombing of Fort Wagner for 36 hours, killing 100 of the remaining defenders. Jeez. Conditions within the fort were becoming intolerable, and the garrison commander, Colonel Lawrence Kite, informed General Beauregard that he now only had 400 men capable of defending the fort. Therefore, on the evening of September 6th, morning of the 7th, Beauregard ordered Confederate forces to abandon their positions. And September 7th, Union troops occupied Fort Wagner. Mm, they were like, what the hell is this? Couldn't they have just done this before the stupid two attacks on Fort Wagner? Right. Instead of losing all those guys that they did? Dumb. Fort Wagner had withstood 60 days of constant bombing, held off a much larger Union army. Yet the Union army and Navy had captured an important position at the mouth of Charleston. Charleston Harbor, and reduced its most formidable fortress to rubble. Despite this, the city of Charleston and Fort Sumner itself would remain in Confederate control until William T. Sherman's armies marched through South Carolina in 1865. Really? Wow. So what was the point? Right. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. And that's it for uh, those three little battles. Huh? Fort Wagner, number two, wasn't all that great. I don't know how they had managed to get... Uh, Three-hour movie out of glory. <laughs> right. I mean... Well, the battle was... Well, the battle scene was only literally like 10 minutes. They spent another two and a half hours training. Literally, it's all that movie is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, with that, I think we might be going back to, uh, yep, West Virginia. We're going to get some more West Virginian stuff with the Battle of Buffington Island. Then we go back to Manassas for the Manassas Gap, a battle of Big Mound, Dead Buffalo Lake. We go back to an Indian battle and uh, the Salineville battle as well. So uh, going back and forth throughout the country here, uh, Lee, Robert E. Lee still retreating from Gettysburg three, t- three weeks later. So uh, final days of the Gettysburg campaign, the Manassas Gap is. And then, uh, yep, <clears throat> that's it. Like I said, no more. All these are little skirmishes for the rest of 1863. And big mounds in North Dakota, dead lakes in North Dakota, same same thing. And then Salineville's in Ohio. So we got an Ohio one, huh? Oh, wow. Then we got another one in uh, North Dakota, Stony Lake. Mm. And then we got the second battle of Fort Sumter coming up in North, uh, South Carolina, though. And then battle of Shaganooga. That's pretty much it, like I said, until uh, Chickamauga. Chickamauga. Whatever that is, I missed it. Where is it? Oh, Chickamauga in September, which is in Georgia. And then other than that, we got a bunch of D's and C's. Um, a couple of A's, but those are nothing. Tennessee's getting some action in here, huh? Nice. Then we'll head into uh, 1864. And this is just the Confederates hanging on by a thread this whole year here. And then, of course, 1865 was a bunch of nothings. And uh, that's be doing it for us And this episode of Battles of the American Civil War. In the meantime, make sure you guys are going to check out our brand new series called According to Wikipedia, where this week we uh, covered part two of our article on Wikipedia, which um, they covered a little bit of controversy. Are they... Uh, are they a good source for schools and whatnot and all that stuff? And plus, uh, they switched from uh, Linux version 17.7, and they switched it to uh, whatever version 2.78. I don't know. And, of course, we got uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers. We're in the middle of the Mafia, wrapping up the Genovese family, which uh, not much info on these guys, but we'll probably do uh, Vincent Gigante. Or, no, this week, this next week's episode will be a three-person a three person with... Uh, forget the guy's names, Katina, Gerardo Katina, Phil Lombardo, and uh, Michele Miranda, which were like a three-person panel ruling while Vito was in prison. So uh, we'll have them, and then we'll move on to Gigante, maybe a couple other people with the uh, Genovese family, then we'll be wrapping those guys up, thank God, because none of these guys have any stories. Um, other than that, yeah, we'll be back next week for three more or five more battles on this Civil War march to the end. And uh, we'll keep it right here on the Bang Dang Network on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a like, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. We'll be back next week for another episode of Battles of Mercs of War. We are the Method of Michigan is with Bang Dang.